Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi, and I want to tell you about a murder that happened here on the 23rd of December 1944. But first, I need to tell you about the events leading up to it. This isn't so much a who done it as a why done it. Now, if you're interested in people, places, and events in Scottish history, then you can click on the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen at any time during this video. Also, don't forget that additional information and ways to support the channel are in the description below. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. This is Culty Bragan, just outside the village of Conray in Perthshire. It's now a community trust with small businesses, allotments and things like that, but it hasn't always been that way. The first time I came here was 40 years ago as a boy, when I was in the Air Cadets, and this place was used for military reserve training. This was the tuck shop. I spent way too much time in there. This was a rifle range. Before it was an orchard, this was an assault course. This is a watchtower and these were the nishin huts that we lived in. They weren't built for us. They were built for prisoners of war in the 1940s. At the time, it was simply called Camp 21. In autumn of 1944, the Allies were pretty confident. They'd landed in Normandy beaches in the summer, established a beachhead and pushed German forces back and they were making good progress. The Germans were finished. They just hadn't admitted it yet. It meant that lots of Germans were now flooding into places like this all over the country. Now generally they were beaten, demoralised and just wanted the war to be over so they could go back to what was left of their homes. Now some were ideological Nazis but others were just soldiers. So they were divided into groups. The British described them as blacks, the proper baddie Nazis, and whites, the good guys. Ironically, if you can see the subtle underlying racial element, you're probably black. If you can't, you might be a Nazi. The greys might be persuaded either way, but mostly they just watch Bake Off. Our story starts in a camp in Devizes in Wiltshire. One of the German prisoners of war was a Sergeant Wolfgang Rustic. Now before the war, he'd lived and worked in London. He'd travelled. He spoke English, French, Polish, Latvian and Magyar. He was a white. He was used as a translator by Lieutenant Colonel Scotland, the Chief British Intelligence Officer, whose parents, incidentally, were from Perthshire here. Rustic hated the Nazis and he could be counted on for information and help. Then, in the first week of November 1944, a prisoner arrived at Devizes who was neither broken, beaten or demoralised. He was young, confident, belligerent and arrogant. His name was Erich Koenig. And when he arrived at Camp Devizes, he immediately aligned with the blacks. He stirred things up, telling everyone that they were still part of the war effort. And then after watching people for a bit, he said, we're going to set up an escape committee. And then he turned to Rostick and said, you won't be part of it. But an escape was planned. And one day, whilst a group of prisoners vigorously shook their blankets of dust out by the perimeter fence, another crawled and snipped the wires. And that night, when lights were out, eight of them came back and slipped through the fence unnoticed until the next day at roll call. And needless to say, a manhunt ensued and they managed to capture two of these escapees. But a few days later, the other six turned up at the door and asked to get back in. That was strange. They were interrogated. Ah, uh, somebody's taken down the road sign so we weren't sure which way it was back to Germany. Okay. Either we're dealing with idiots or they think they're dealing with idiots. Either way, I don't think they're idiots. They were released back into the camp, but under a cloud. Now, it so happened that two Americans from the 17th Airborne called Brandstetter and Hurtzel appeared in the camp. Now, that's not entirely surprising. The Americans were part of the war effort. There was a recently established American base nearby. These guys were coming on board as part of the interrogation team for captured Germans. Anyway, they're wandering around the camp one day, and as they walk into a room, Koenig is addressing the group, saying, 
It's the ammunition store that's vital. Now he sees the Americans and he stops talking. Now, these newly arrived Americans just walk through the room and they don't let on that they're here as interrogators and fluent in German. But very soon it becomes apparent because the conspirators are hauled in for interrogation by the British and the Americans. Now, one of the conspirators, one of the escapees who'd come home, called Schmidt, refuses to cooperate. But he points out to his American interrogators that they might think the war's over, but it's not. All your troops are on the continent. This country's empty, but for old men, man and a dad's army. There are a quarter of a million able-bodied German prisoners of war in camps up and down the country. Imagine if we all escaped at the same time. The US 11th Armoured Division in the base up the road wouldn't be able to stop us. We could take arms, ammunition, vehicles, tanks, even aeroplanes from the nearby airbase. We've got pilots, you know. We could march on London and you couldn't stop us. He was a bit ballsy. One might even say overconfident and loose-lipped. You see, the question that came to Brandstetter and Hurtzell's minds was, here's a man who comes back to prison because there are no road signs in England to tell him how to get back to Germany. But when he arrives back, he's managed to establish the location, size and function of several Allied encampments. They think we're idiots. Now, the conspirators were taken out of the camp to be interrogated by Lieutenant Colonel Scotland and his chums up in London. It turns out there was a reason that Koenig was more confident and arrogant than your typical German prisoner. There was a reason that he'd come in, shook things up and started an escape committee. There was a reason that the escapees had come back to the camp with detailed information about military operations and resources in the surrounding area. Because that's what Koenig was sent to organise. You see, in autumn 1944, when Koenig was captured, captured, the Germans were on their last legs. But they'd planned one last roll of the dice with a breakout through their den forest. Now, you might have seen the film with English-speaking Germans dressed as American MPs behind the lines, and Telly Savalas was the tank commander. It's called the Battle of the Bulge. Anyway, Koenig was sent way deep behind the lines, to the British Isles themselves, to organise the March on London. And it wasn't just at Devizes. At the same time as the Germans launched their offensive in the Ardennes Forest, there were breakouts and attempted breakouts from camps in Scotland, England and Wales. This was a concerted plan as part of the last gasp offensive. The good news is that the forces were now on alert and the devised conspiracists had been taken out of the system. All because of a chance hearing of one sentence by Bradstetter and Hurtzell. On these moments, history turned. Now, you can get much more detail in a book called The March on London. I'll leave a link in the description below. There's also a book called Camp 21 Comrie about this camp. Now, the worst may have been averted, but there were still some prisoners on the loose. Lieutenant Colonel Scotland certainly wasn't going to put these conspirators back in the Devizes camp where they'd come from. So he sent them here to Camp 21 on the edge of Comrie. Camp 21 was divided into four compounds. A, B, C, surprise, surprise, D. Moving from black through to grey to white. Compound A was for the proper mental Nazis and they weren't allowed to mix with the other compounds. Compound A is now an orchard and an allotment. How sweet. Compound B has pretty much disappeared. But you can still see C and D. Why Koenig and his mates were put in Compound B here, I don't know. Certainly Lieutenant Colonel Scotland wanted more information out of them. And he might have thought that they would have talked more openly in that kind of environment. Scotland's ears would be Sergeant Rostig. That's right, they sent Rostig from Devizes to Conway to live in B Compound with escape conspirators. Rostig, the man who had never been trusted with escape plans in the first place. They must have known that they were signing his death warrant. And so it was that two days after arriving at Conway here in Compound B, the night before Christmas Eve of 1944, that Rostig woke up in his bed to find Koenig going through his affairs. 
and when he jumped out of bed to grab Koenig, he himself was grabbed by the waiting arms of several comrades. He was taken to a seat in front of a desk where Rostig was beaten, kicked and struck with iron bars throughout the night of questioning. The answers didn't matter. It was a beaten he was here for. And when he could no longer use his arm, his hand was held for him as he was made to sign a traitor's confession. And then a noose was placed around his neck and he was taken outside here to the waiting mob who beat him more. By the time they took him to hang from a pipe in the bathhouse, he was already dead. But things had to be done right. Eight men were tried in London. Five for the murder and three with complicity. Five, including Kooning, were hung. The other three were spared. Now you know the why done it. Who done it? Who did kill Sergeant Rostig? Was it the Germans who hung for committing the murder? Or was it Lieutenant Colonel Scotland who sent him here, knowing that they would? Nobody comes out of this story well. There's neither black nor white, only shades of grey. I hope you've liked this. Uh, if you have, please give it the thumbs up and share it. I mean, Doc is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.